Second Chronicles chapter 19. Yes, only comfortable seating here. Which, by the way, if you wish to be comfortable, the last two rows back there are the worst chairs that we have here. And so, just so you know, and they're also the those are also the most distracted rows. So, anyway, I want to let you know that as well. Just some insider tips for you here tonight. We ordered those chairs about, what, five years after we ordered our initial chairs? We initially ordered 50 chairs, and then we got to where we around about 60 people, so we ordered 25 more chairs. And the company, those are, they're all made in the USA. These are made in Georgia, the ones in the front. They're by church chair. And the ones in the back are made by a company in Texas. Mm -hmm. And both of them are better than the ones that are made in China. I've checked out a lot of different church chairs over the years. But they used to advertise these front set, the, the original ones that we had, as being capable of care, or holding a full-size Dodge 1500 pickup. They would advertise them by putting one chair under each of the wheels. And so if we ever do an oil change on the bus, I think we're going to take the chairs outside <laughs> and put the bus on them and just see if we can do one up. But anyway, that the company, Church Chairs, was a really good company. And the original owner, I think, died or passed on the business to their children. And very soon after the children got the business, they just ran it into the ground. And they, uh, they, were, they were taking payments for chairs and then not delivering. And so then they went through bankruptcy. And I know of some churches that I actually recommended the chairs to, and they ordered from them, gave like a $5,000 deposit. And then they, uh, wow. they kept their money and went through bankruptcy. So I didn't want to, even though they were still in business, I didn't want to do business with them. So I called them and said, I'm ordering chairs, but I'm not ordering them from you. By the way, I always do that. Give people a heads up if you're not doing business with them. Every time I eat at KFC, I call Popeyes and tell them why I'm not eating there. So I like your, I like your chicken better, but the way you treated me that one time, I just want you to know, buck seventy-five, you're not getting them this time. So <laughs> whatever it is. But I do think that sometimes it's helpful to do that. So I called a company in Texas. They said, we're very, very familiar with Church Chairs product. We make one exactly like that. We'll make one just like what they made. But they're not. They're junk. And so don't buy anything made in Texas. <laughs> Their chairs aren't bigger. And I'll bet you they couldn't even hold a 1500 Dodge Ram. But uh, anyway, that has nothing to do with much of anything. If you're reading through your Bible in a year, you should be somewhere around where we're at in the Scripture tonight. Maybe a little past there, maybe not quite there, depending on how you're doing with it. But we're in 2 Chronicles chapter 19. I'd like to read a couple of verses, and then we will uh, we'll pray and ask the Lord's help tonight. This is one of those stories or, not, or accounts of the Scripture of something that happened that just makes a huge impression when you really understand it. I just I love this part of the Bible. When I was a kid, when I get grounded, my parents would ground me from reading. They'd say you can't read anything except for the Bible. And so this is this is my stomping grounds, right? Between first and second Kings, first, second Samuel, and first and second Chronicles. When I wasn't allowed to read books for fun, I read this part of the Bible for fun. So a little tip to you kids. This is the fun part of the Bible. It's just got great stories of courage and, and uh, just wonderful things. So 2 Chronicles chapter 19. How many of y'all got grounded from reading when you were children? Seriously? Yeah. You got grounded from reading? To read? Yes. How, did, how do you make a kid read? Tony, you got grounded from reading? My parents would ground us. They wouldn't let us read anything. Except for Mrs. Canavan, did you ever ground your daughters from reading? Uh, I, I feel like there were times when I wouldn't let them read a book until they did their chores. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. We weren't allowed to read in the car sometimes. Yeah, we weren't allowed to read in the car sometimes. On, on a trip where they were supposed to be looking at the scenery. See, y'all thought smartphones invented the whole being somewhere but not really being there. <laughs> but actually, they had books back in the Stone Ages. I mean, they had, they literally had like cave children like carrying rocks around distracted. You know, so, all right. Let's let's read our text and then we'll pray. Verse one of Second Chronicles nineteen. And Josh, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani the seer, went out to meet him, and said to the to King Jehoshaphat, "Shouldst thou help the ungodly 
and love them that hate the Lord. Therefore is the wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land, and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. And Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim, and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. And we'll pray here, and then we'll, we'll introduce our uh, topic this evening. Father, thank You for what we're looking at this evening, the great truth in it. And God, I just thank You that You are such a merciful, but yet judicious and careful God. And I pray that we would take heed to the things that we learn about You this evening. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Well, this is rather a strong statement. We'll look at the details of what Jehoshaphat had done. But Jehoshaphat was actually an exceptional king in Israel. Actually, Jehoshaphat was one of only a couple of kings that put away the high places and the groves. And we see in verse 4 that he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. Literally, Jehoshaphat was an evangelist king. He had had a wicked father and wicked grandfather, and he literally went out and won the people back who had been turned to worship Balaam, who had been turned to worship uh, in high places instead of Jerusalem. And Jehoshaphat moved to Jerusalem. What's significant about Jerusalem? What? The temple is significant about Jerusalem. So that Jerusalem is where the temple is, and that's where legitimate worship is. And God's people were always trying to worship somewhere besides Jerusalem. And God was always a stickler about how Jerusalem should be. You know, if you'll ever do a study on high places, you'll begin like I did. I remember the first time I began to study high places. And I was going to preach about high places in people's hearts. And I got really confused at first because every high place I could find in the Scripture was a place where God had met someone. And God had done a miracle or something spectacular had happened. And then that place became a, a memorial, a place of memorial. And then when it became a place of memorial, all of a sudden the significance of what God had done surpassed in people's minds the significance of who God presently was. And then people began to look back to the memorial and they began to make more of a location than they made of a God who just graced the location with His presence. And I will say to you that geographically, if Jerusalem did mean something to God, it wouldn't mean anything at all. Because it's just a place. But God said, this is where I'm going to be, and this is where I'll be worshipped, and this is where it's right to worship me, and so this is what I want from you. And God's people were always trying to figure out a good way to not do what God said. And a great place to worship God and a place where God didn't say to worship is to find a place where God allowed something or God, uh, I shouldn't say allowed something, where God met with uh, someone and there was something special about God there to say, well, God, this is a special place too. You know, it's incredible how oftentimes we are so easily distracted from the perfect, exact what God wants for something instead of what God wants. Isn't it so? A lot of times we say, well, this is good. It's so tough as a pastor to counsel someone who you know that is following their flesh, but they're following their flesh in a positive way. They always got a way of justifying and saying, well, this is, this is a good thing about this. Proof's always in the pudding, though, isn't it? The fruits always demonstrate uh, what the motive was behind them, don't they? It always, ends up, it always ends up being found out. But you can't ever tell someone that says, well, you know, this is a good thing, here's why. I can't say, well, you know what, you're replacing it with, with the best thing. Just, I don't know God's perfect plan for people. But you know what, God oftentimes shows that, doesn't He? And here we have an instance where Jehoshaphat is referenced to having really failed in his life, and yet God said about Jehoshaphat, He said, you know something, you, you love me in your heart. There's something in your heart that I'd nuke you otherwise. You'd be dead otherwise, but you, you, your heart's perfect toward me. 
And then we see Jehoshaphat actually being exceptional in that most of the time we see a good king in Israel. We usually see them starting out well and ending poorly. But Jehoshaphat actually kind of started well, had a bad middle season, and then ended well. And if you were to read further in chapter 19 of 2 Chronicles, you would also see that Jehoshaphat set up judges all throughout the kingdom of Judah. And he, he told them a couple of things. He says, you better judge rightly before God. He says, you better not accept payments. You better not accept bribes. I mean, he was a stickler for doing things God's way. And he really ended up being a great king in Israel. But he was a colossal failure at one point. And so I want to look at uh, a couple of things. First of all, let me just make a statement to you so you know what our conclusion is. I'll state it. Hopefully we'll be able to restate it. Uh, but I want us to understand that there is in the heart of God a very, very merciful mindset towards someone who loves Him. And there's not any individual who at some time, at some juncture in their life, does not fail God. There isn't an individual who doesn't fail God at some juncture, to some degree. And I'm not justifying those things. But God specifically had a real problem with a, with a phase in Jehoshaphat's life. And the phase in his life was when he was willing to help the ungodly. When he was willing to help the ungodly. You say, Pastor, if I'm going down the road and I see somebody that has a flat tire on the side of the road and I don't think they're saved, should I help them? Well, actually, this isn't the same thing. This is an Old Testament example of being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. The New Testament of the Scripture tells us, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? and so on. What part hath uh, Christ with Belial in the temple of God uh, with the devil? What, what does a Christian have to do with a heathen or a pagan? And at this time in Israel, uh, Israel was turned away from God and they had the most wicked king Israel ever had, King Ahab. Ahab was a contemporary with Jehoshaphat. Now do you see where I'm going? See, Jehoshaphat is king of Judah, and he's turning the people's heart to God. He's dwelling in Jerusalem, which is where the temple is, and he is setting up judges. He's doing things right. He initially began by not worshiping Balaam like Asa, his father, had done. And he's starting off the right way. And in the end, we see in this conclusion where God actually says about him, there are good things found in thee, verse 3, and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. So God says to Jehoshaphat something, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way, but God said to Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, you messed up, and I ought to just kill you. But you, did, you have some things right in your heart, and because of that, my desire is mercy towards you. Now, let's straighten some things out dispensationally, shall we? What age do we live in? Church age, okay. Uh, is the church Israel? Are they one and the same? No. No, they're very, very distinctly different. Okay, uh, how are we saved today? By faith. Salvation's always been by faith. Um, is there... Is there a notion or is there an idea or mindset that God excuses sin or imperfection in a believer? Well, we're justified. Well, a lot of people think that, don't they? Like, well, you know, there's some things God overlooks. You know, a lot of Christians think there's good sin and bad sin. The reality of it is, is that God took Jehoshaphat's sin very seriously. God took Jehoshaphat's sin very seriously. And uh, the Bible says in verse 2, Therefore is the wrath is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So how did God view Jehoshaphat's sin that we'll look at in a minute? What word is used to describe God's attitude toward Jehoshaphat's sin? Wrath. Okay, God's wrath. Does that sound to you like minced words? Does it sound as though God is choosing His words carefully? 
making sure Jehoshaphat knows that it's, you know, only a level 1, not level 10. Wrath is a serious word, isn't it? And God's wrath is toward Jehoshaphat. But we see something about Jehoshaphat, and we see that it is post this event that caused God's wrath toward him. The Bible says there are good things found in thee, specifically in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land, hast prepared thine heart to seek God. I want to ask the question tonight, what caused Jehoshaphat at this juncture in his life to have prepared his heart to seek God? You say God? I did. Okay, uh, well, he evidently had a real relationship with God. He always did, though. Um, Prophet. Okay, so the prophet knew that he prepared his heart to seek God, but who did the Bible say prepared his heart? Who was responsible for the preparation in his heart? He was. He was. It was Jehoshaphat had deliberately made the decision that he was going to seek God. When did he make that decision? Well, if you want to answer this decision, if you want to answer the question accurately, you'll, there, there are several correct answers. You could say when he started to reign. And you can say at this point in time. In other words, this is a, right now you've prepared your heart to seek God. And I just want to kind of hone in and look at where Jehoshaphat is at here now and what got him here. See, right now, Jehoshaphat is at a, what we call sometimes a come to Jesus moment. Sometimes Christians have something that happens in their lives and it gets their attention. Sometimes we say it's a come to Jesus moment. Now we're talking about usually talking about lost people when something terrible happens and all of a sudden it shakes up their foundations of everything that they know and and kind of uh, disrupts their world to the to the extent that they get serious about God. Well, Jehoshaphat has just gotten serious about God and isn't the first time in his life because he started out that way, but he is at a place in a time in his life when he's ready to be a godly ruler. But there was a juncture, there was an interruption, and I want to look at it this evening because it's very interesting. And now we see that Jehoshaphat has been brought back to being what he intended to be when he started out. So let's go back to chapter 18. And uh, look at verse 1. Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. Who's the wickedest king in the history of Israel? Ahab. 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 Okay, so our mystery is revealed, right? If you're at this point saying, well, what did Jehoshaphat do? You know, what did, how did he mess up? The, the Bible says he joined affinity with Ahab. Look at this. And after certain years, you notice that word affinity? That's a word that's akin to affection. I mean, he and Ahab are brothers, man. As Sidney used to go here, used to say, dozers, man. They're, it's kind of like a combination of brothers and cousins, I think is what dozen is. But uh, they're brothers. And they have an affinity and affection. And he went down to Ahab to Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance. And for the people that he had with him, and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. And if you were to read the parallel to this in 1 Kings chapter 22, you would see Ramoth Gilead was... A, a section of territory that was kind of, it would have been in between the two kingdoms. And because of being a neutral zone, it had come under uh, reign or authority of the wicked. That is, the people that aren't God's children, the Canaanites in the land. And it was, it was a problem. Uh, that, and then the Syrians uh, had taken over. And so now there's a section of Ramoth Gilead that... Because neither of these men, neither of the kingdoms got along, had become susceptible. And now Ahab is saying, well, since we're getting along, let's put a, the kibosh to this whole, you know, not having protection in Ramoth Gilead and, and being in bondage and paying tribute and so forth. And let's, let's, drive out, uh, let's drive out the people that don't belong there. Well, how does that sound to you? It's not a trick question. How's that sound to you? Does God want the enemy driven out of the land? Did He always want the enemy driven out of the land? Yes. So it sounds sensible and it sounds logical, doesn't it? 
There's nothing wrong with what they're thinking about doing. What's wrong with what they're doing is who they're doing it with. See, Ahab is yoking up with Jehoshaphat, and from Ahab's perspective, he doesn't care what God thinks anyway. never has. But Jehoshaphat is yoking up with Ahab, and guess what? God cares about what Jehoshaphat does, and Jehoshaphat is supposed to care about what God thinks. And Jehoshaphat actually does. Matter of fact, he actually wants God's opinion about it. This, this is one of the best false prophet, true prophet stories. There's a lot of them in Jeremiah and different parts of the Scripture. But this is one of my favorite ones. Let's just read it because it, it just reads so well. Verse 4, And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Therefore the king of Israel gathered together of prophets four hundred men and said unto them, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. Well, Ahab had his ready-made prophets. I mean, he had his guys that would say whatever he wanted them to say. And he had four hundred of them. There are always more false prophets than true prophets just always rings true. There's all, there are always more false prophets than true prophets, and false prophets always prophesy what you want to hear. And so, uh, then he, in verse 6, but Jehoshaphat said, I love this answer, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And Jehoshaphat, though he is yoked up with Ahab, and he ought to be, still wants to know what God thinks, and when these false prophets prophesy, God's go up, God's, God is in this, God is with you, and God will bless you, and all these things they want to hear, Jehoshaphat's response is, do you have any prophets that aren't fake? <laughs> he still has some discernment, doesn't he? Jehoshaphat actually knows enough about God that he knows this isn't the way God talks and the way God speaks. My friend, if you find a preacher of the Word of God who always tells you what your flesh wants to hear, it's just a real good sign. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, you don't have to have a whole lot of things to corroborate. But if he always makes you feel good about everything your flesh wants to do, and every and always tells you exactly what you want to hear, it's a real good sign he's just a phony and a fake, and he's trying to get something from you instead of trying to have you get something from God. And that's what these false prophets are expressly doing. And so, in verse 7, I love this answer. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There's yet one man by whom we may inquire the Lord, but I hate him, for he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil. The same as Micaiah, the son of Amla, and Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Oh, be nice about the, the man of God. <laughs> don't you love, I mean, what, and don't you love Ahab's response? Well, there's a true prophet, but I don't like his message. He's never said what I want him to say. <laughs> there is truth, but I, re I don't like it. He's, never, he's, he's negative, man. The guy's negative, negative, negative. He always prophesies against me. <laughs> and uh, verse 8, And the king of Israel called for one of his officers and said, Now here, listen, listen to how they try to stack the odds. Fetch quickly Micaiah the son of Imla. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat king of Judah sat either of them on, their, on his throne, clothed in their robes, and sat in a void place at the entering in of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Do you see the picture here? Is this ridiculous? Where is Jehoshaphat king? Where's his kingdom? Judah. Judah. And now he's got a throne in Samaria. Both of these kings, you know, they're on their thrones, they got their little robes, and they're in a void or a neutral place in Samaria, which is not where Jehoshaphat is supposed to rule. But it's like this, you know, this collusion between these two kings, and they're working hard to, you know, form this political alliance. And it's just beautiful, you know, how neutral everything is. And so they send a messenger to get Micaiah. And Bible says in verse 11, all the prophets prophesied so, saying, 
Oh, oh, verse, look at what Zedekiah said. In verse 10, And Zedekiah the son of Chanana had made him horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, With these shalt thou push Syria until they be consumed. He had an object lesson. You know, he had an illustration. He wasn't just your run-of-the-mill prophet that gave a message and described it. No, I mean the guy had really a great lesson with it. You know, sort of like a pastor riding a Harley onto the stage to preach a sermon. You know, and just, man, I mean, he's just a good... I don't know how many times I've heard things like, man, I mean, the pastor's such a good preacher. He rode a Harley out on the stage. And, and uh, you know, I mean, the message is just so much more meaningful. And because he was on a Harley, and they... And I, I've always... When somebody tells me a story about a great message like this, I always ask, what was the message about? <laughs> Tell me about what the message was. And then I'll say, what 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 passages they preach. Normally, they have no clue what the Bible said or what was preached, but the message was just really dynamic. I mean, the pastor's dynamic. I remember one time a guy telling me, yeah, you know, the pastor, he preached a sermon, and he actually had his bed on stage, and he was laying in his bed, and he preached the sermon in bed, and man, it made it, just made an impact, just made an impression. Well, here's another one of these great messages. Zedekiah gets him some horns of iron. You imagine iron horns. And he's got them and he said, with these horns you're going to push out the Syrians. And I mean, this he put some work into this message. This is dynamic. This is like, you know, what people want to hear. And, uh, you know, and you can visualize it. And you can see like the horns, you know, poking the Syrians one by one and carrying them out of the land. It's so a dynamic, great message. I He probably had a big screen, you know, and came out in smoke and just, you know, everybody was eating popcorn and they dimmed the lights and the atmosphere was perfect for this prophetic message. And probably when he said it, you know, he pulled this, you know, cover off and, you know, and then the lights slowly lit on it and then the music played, the drum roll, and then the horns came out and boom, you know, God spoke. Drama dramatized. Okay. This is Zedekiah's message. It's a good message, isn't it? I mean, it's like this is what they want to hear, and it's it's dynamic, it's dramatic, and you know there are four hundred other prophets, and not a, a single one of them got an honorable mention. But Zedekiah's horns got him in the Bible, man. So we're talking about you know great message, good story, okay? And uh, in verse uh, eleven. All the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it in the hand of the king, in the hand of the king. And the messenger that went to call Micaiah spake to him, saying, Behold the words of the prophets declare good to the king with one assent. Hey man, we've got unity, we're unified on this, we've all gotten together on it. So let thy word therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs, and speak thou good. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, even when my God saith, that will I speak. So Micaiah was non committal. He said, well, I'll say whatever God tells me to. When he was come to the king, the king said, said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And he said, go up and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. Now, don't you love this? This is just, just gets beautiful, okay? They said, Micaiah, would you please just go with the flow once? Would you just prophesy something good? And he said, sure. Go up and prosper. God's with you. You know, He's in your back pocket. You're set. And that's how He said it, I'm sure. You know, I mean, here's a charm. Take it with you. You know, put it on your horn when you drive out the Syrians or something. You know? Um, verse 15. And the king said to him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou say nothing but the truth to me in the name of the Lord? Ahab said, I know good and well that that's not true. <laughs> now, how did Ahab know it wasn't true? Huh? Well, not, well, because it was good? No. Okay, let me ask you a question. Was God just cruel? Did He just say, you know, I hate Ahab. I'm just going to make everything bad for him. Is that the deal? Was Micaiah just a, you know what, I'll prophesy for Ahab, but only if it's bad. You know, I don't get in on the good stuff. I'm the bad prophet. You know, he wore the black cape and the black mask, and he was the, you know, the bad guy prophet. Now, honestly, seriously, how did Ahab know that he was lying? 
Because he had 400 prophets that he paid for the message, for that message. And he knew that message was a lie. I mean, Ahab had his prophets that said what he wanted to say. And if a true prophet is saying the same thing the lying prophet says, then you know it's a lie. Listen to me, Christian. I have seen men of God, I believe men of God, change their message. I've seen guys, I've seen guys, man, I mean, they preach the Word of God and they understand the Word of God and then, I don't know, something like a switch flips or something and they just go off. Now, that's not Micaiah here. Micaiah said, I'll preach, I'll say whatever God says. And God told Micaiah to do this to Ahab. Go ahead and tell him what he wants to hear. Go ahead. <laughs> and Ahab said, you're lying to me, Micaiah. So then Micaiah says, he said, well, you know, I saw all Israel you know, scattered around the hills and they didn't have a shepherd. In other words, you died. I saw that you were killed, Ahab. Uh, verse uh, 16, then he said, I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, they have no master. Let them return therefore every man to his house in peace. He said, Ahab, if you go to battle, you're dead. The people will survive, but you won't. God will let them go home, but you'll be the guy that doesn't go home. And listen, Ahab, in verse 17, the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did not I tell thee that he would not prophesy good unto me, but evil? That's like, Ahab, he gave you a good message. Why don't you take it? Stop for a second, will you? Even people that want to hear a lie actually kind of want to know what the truth is, don't they? Even when you want to believe a lie, you still want to kind of know what the truth is. There's just something ironic about liars and about wicked individuals wanting to actually know what the truth is. Explore it a little bit. If Ahab had gone the distinct step between desiring to know what the truth is so that he could weigh it in his decision making to wanting to know what the truth is so that he could practice it and live it in his life he'd have been a different king you know there are many individuals I don't know the heart of any person but there are many individuals who like to handle truth. They want to know what truth is. I believe, not knowing specifically the hearts of individuals, but I think I've been to seminary with guys that want to comprehend truth. They're not going to embrace it. They're not going to allow it to affect their lives. But they're interested in knowing what it is. I remember being in um, fundamentalism, uh, church in the 20th century class in seminary. And I remember sitting there with guys as we looked at the history of fundamentalism and realizing that you're going to be either on the right side or the wrong side when it comes to that. I remember sitting with guys in class who I think understood very, very well what the issues were and understood very well what the right and the wrong of it is and yet went out of there on the wrong side. For me, it's always been hard to understand. How can you be exposed to truth and not embrace it? But Ahab is here a prime example of an individual that that was his mindset. He wanted to know the truth. And when he heard it, it made him angry. And he's still going to do his own thing. And so God sent a spirit up to Ahab to tell him what he wanted to hear. There's a little story about that. Um, here's what happened to Micaiah. Verse 23, Oh, Zedekiah comes back. You ready? You like Zedekiah. This time he rode a tank on the stage. You know, he's coming in and serious. And, and it was not just smoke. He came up you know, out of a pit of fire. You know, then Zedekiah the son of Chinana came near and smote Micaiah upon the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? He asked Micaiah a question Micaiah couldn't answer. Stumped him with a question he didn't know the answer to. So he takes 
my coyote, bam, hits him in the face. He said, which way did the Spirit of God go when He came to speak to you? <laughs> I don't want to be too silly, but let's indulge for just a minute, will you please? When God's Spirit came to Micaiah and told him what was going to happen if Ahab went to battle, he didn't say, oh, by the way, Micaiah, I wanted, you to, let, wanted to let you know I came down you know, the road you know, from the east and I hung a right at so-and-so's barn and I went to... Well, I just want to let you know the route I took to get here. Seriously? You know, it is always, always, always a tactic of individuals who don't have a good message or a logical position to throw up some illogical question and if you can't answer a question about something then to try to say, well, you don't know what you're talking about because you don't even know which way the Spirit of the Lord came. Try it sometime, you know. <laughs> it's a straw man. If God wanted to tell Micaiah which way the Spirit of the Lord came, he would, but Micaiah didn't didn't indulge the question. He simply said, He'll tell you. I don't need to tell you. The Spirit of the Lord will tell you. Notice in verse um, 24, Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see on that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. <laughs> uh, Zedekiah, when you when you go to go to your hideout, when you get in there, the Spirit of the Lord will tell you which way he came to talk to me. <laughs> All right. So then the king of Israel said, Take ye Micaiah and carry him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison and feed him with bread of affliction and with water of affliction until I return in peace. Now, I haven't studied bread of affliction or water of affliction, but I suspect that it's that Ezekiel... Uh, you know, what is it? Ezekiel... Uh, four nine. Th what is it? 19... No, 4-9. Four 4-9. Nine. Four nine, Ezekiel 4-9 bread. Okay, so look it up in your local stores. Look it up in Ezekiel. I think that the bread of affliction was Ezekiel 4-9 bread. That's, now, this, this is just my surmising. Nobody told me. It's just my guess. It's Ezekiel 4-9 bread. Okay, moving on. That's for your, that's for your uh, personal edification. Micaiah said, If thou certainly return in peace, then hath not the Lord spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, all you people. Ahab's getting pretty bold. He said, Take him back and lock him up. Tell my son to lock him up. Tell him to feed him bread of affliction and water of affliction and until I return in peace. Basically, starve this guy until I get back in peace. And <laughs> Micaiah's response was, well, <laughs> yeah, you know something? If you, if you return in peace, God hasn't spoken by me. In other words, he said, Ahab, you're not coming back. You're not coming back peacefully. You don't get to do that. Now, we're to, we, we began our message this evening talking about Jehoshaphat and his allegiance with Ahab, but we've had this caveat of looking at the, who Jehoshaphat is a, had his alliance with, and we've seen a guy that was unwilling to accept the false message from Micaiah, and he was unwilling to accept the truth from Micaiah, and he's become emboldened in his in his resolve, hasn't he? He's become so bold that he said, lock him up. And when I get back, I'm going to deal with him. And Micaiah said, you're not coming back to deal with me. So, you know, the bread of affliction would be better than what you're going to get. Well, you know the story. If you look at verse 29. The king of Israel said unto Jeho Jehoshaphat, I'll disguise myself and will go to the battle, but put thou on thy robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went to battle. Now this is not this is not smart. I don't understand the insanity of Jehoshaphat, but you know when you are trying to please wicked peers, you're not really sane. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what Christians will do when they try to mesh with the world, when they try to be like the world. It's incredible the worldliness in Christianity. 
It breaks my heart today that Christians aren't straight on the matter of strong drink. Why is it that Christians don't know whether strong drink is good or evil? Is it because there's a mystery about it in the world? Well, actually, worldly people who get their act together realize the danger of alcohol. Why is it that Christians are shaky today on moral issues? They just don't know. I saw on social media today, I keep, I keep deleting people. I'm going to have less than 5,000 friends pretty soon if this happens. <laughs> Actually, less than 4,000. You max out at 5,000. I'm going to have less, I'm going to be under 4,000 pretty soon if, if this keeps happening every day. But today, on social media, guys were debating the woman taken in adultery. And they were saying, you know, that basically it's okay for a man to commit adultery and not okay for a woman. Adultery, unfaithfulness. It takes two people to be unfaithful, doesn't it? Normally. Uh, anyway. And uh, so, yeah, I'm losing Facebook friends. It's, it's incredible, incredible to me the things that people who name the name of Christ, the things that they're confused about. Actually. Okay, Ahab just said, Jehoshaphat, why don't you put on my clothes? The Syrians are trying to kill me. And I want to go to the battle, so put on my clothes so they won't know who I am. And you'll look like me. Every time I've ever read this, I've thought, this is about the time that I pack in and go home. <laughs> you know? You know, there's a certain point, you know, they, we have a lot of phrases like, you don't throw good money after bad. Yeah. You know, you got to know when to cut your losses. Mm -hmm. There's a certain point in time when you have to say, okay, I shouldn't have gone this far, but I'm still alive. So it's time to go home. <laughs> there's just a certain point, isn't there, when, when wisdom ought to kick in? That ought to be this moment for Jehoshaphat, but it isn't. He actually does it. And he puts on King Ahab's clothes, and they spot him, and they think that he's Ahab. And you know the only thing that saves him? Look at this, verse 31. It came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, it's the king of Israel. Oh, they fell for it. Let's kill him. Therefore they compassed about him to fight. The only thing that saves him, but Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him. And God moved them to depart from him. For it came to pass that when the chariot captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, so they turned back again from pursuing him. Well, the only thing that saved him, God. <laughs> Jehoshaphat at least is, has got something Ahab doesn't have. He has a relationship with God, and he actually knows that God's the only one that can help him. He has witnessed the true prophet in Israel prophesy Ahab's death. He's witnessed it. He's here for this. He watched Micaiah disrespected and imprisoned. And he's, he's a tender-hearted man. He, he, loves, he knows the Lord. He's watched this, and now Ahab has said, hey, put my clothes on and go to battle. They're trying to kill me, and I don't want to look like me, so you put my clothes on. I mean, couldn't they have hired a servant to do that? Couldn't they have got like a straw, you know, like a scarecrow to do that or something? And here he is, and all of a sudden, the Syrians, they're not even fighting anyone else. They're just honing in on him. They're all going for the king. And, they, and he's actually the king, but they don't know it. He's the king of Judah. And they surround him, and he just screams, God, help me! And God helped him. And that was the only reason he survived. Now, Chris, there are a lot of lessons here. I don't know how many times people have said to me, in tears, shaking their heads, their heads hung low. And they said, how did I get here? How did I get here? And you know, I know how they got there. And sometimes it's my job to tell them. Well, it started. And then, you know, when you, when you, when you made the decision that you weren't going to, you knew what was right in this instance. You decided not to. And when you decided you weren't going to grow, and then when you got away from the Lord and you got out of fellowship and then you, when you got in that relationship and you could just go on and on and they say, how did I get here? Well, listen, my friend, you know how you got there. Can you imagine Jehoshaphat asking that question right now? How did I get here? Well, first of all, you made an allegiance with a godless man. 
Secondly, you overlooked the prophecy of a true prophet that said this, is, this juncture is going to fail. You looked at a prophet of God being imprisoned by a guy who, quote, was your friend. And then you put on the guy who's supposed to die. God told Ahab, you're going to die. And so Ahab said, I got a neat trick. I'm, God, can't, God doesn't have an answer to this one. If you put on my clothes, God can't kill me. You know what I'm thinking? If God... Don't, don't take this wrong way. If God were that dumb, it's not a very safe place for Jehoshaphat. I mean, if God doesn't know... You know, if he, if he can't tell Ahab from his clothing, seriously, then Jehoshaphat ought to put on his clothing. Right? But he does. And now all of a sudden, it's gotten serious and he's a dead man. And the Syrians, the entire army that's fighting against both Israel and Judah, have ignored everyone except for Jehoshaphat. They said, there he is. And they all went for him. You want to talk about scary. There's no way to survive that except for crying out to God. And my friend, listen to me. When you come to place and you say, God, how did I get here? Just cry out. I'm not saying it's right to get there. There's no defense for Jehoshaphat at this juncture, is there? But do you see his God? It's a lie from the devil that a God who is still giving you breath cannot deliver you. There's no question Jehoshaphat deserves to die. There's no question that the problems he has, he ought to own. But he can't. And so he cries out to God and God delivers him. Another guy in the Syrian armor, you know, does the, I shot an arrow in the, where, in the air where it lands, I know not where, or however that goes, I do not care. Or, you know, like just shoots an arrow and a random arrow hits Ahab. Random arrow, I said, not one that God directed or anything like that. Because we know God couldn't shoot an arrow directly at Ahab on purpose because he was disguised. <laughs> he was in disguise, right? <laughs> Syrians can't find him. <laughs> this shouldn't be funny, but, but people get really stupid when they're in sin. They do. You know, sometimes it's really difficult when you're trying to deal with people that are not doing right it's difficult sometimes to laugh at the cover-up. The way they try to cover their tracks or hide things, and you just think... <laughs> Either you think I'm really, really dumb, or I've given you some kind of reason to think I'm that dumb, or you literally are out of your mind with sin. You know, sin is insanity, isn't it? What's the definition for insanity? Well, I don't have a good textbook definition here tonight, but I've been defining it this way for a long time. Insanity is anything that isn't the way it ought to be or isn't normal. You see somebody going down the street and they're not acting right, right? See somebody and they're talking, but they're not talking to anyone. They're fighting, but there's no one there. Like there's a guy that used to be close to where we lived in our condo, and he was always fist fighting. You know, Tony, you remember the guy that was fighting the bush the one time? Remember the guy fighting the bush? He was in McDonald's and then he was sword fighting the bush. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, what they're doing doesn't make any sense. Listen to me, Christian. No person has ever gotten away with sin. No person's ever been the first person to do evil and have it have good outcome. It's never happened and yet people all the time try it and that's nuts, isn't it? And that really is Je Jehoshaphat here and this Ahab here. They're just out of their minds. And any person who thinks they can just get away with something is just out of their head. And if you think a little sin won't hurt you, you're, you're nuts. That's an insanity. Anytime you sin, my friend, you're not, you're not reasonable, you're not logical. Somehow you think that for some reason it's okay or right or it'll work out, and it will not. 
Sin will destroy you. And the, the little sin is where it begins. And that's Jehoshaphat. You know, Jehoshaphat knew why the kingdom of Israel and Judah were divided, didn't he? He knew what the problems were. Did Jehoshaphat know that Ahab didn't care about spiritual things? If he didn't know that, probably about the time he hired 400 false prophets, he might have been able to guess it. He had enough discernment to say, isn't there a prophet of God? Isn't there a true prophet anywhere? About the time Micaiah prophesied the truth, Jehoshaphat should have known it. You know, the progressions, when you get into sin, my friend, the progression is rapid, and it's incredible how far away from reasonable, from truth, that you'll get. And so in the end, verse 33, a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Therefore he said to his chariot man, Turn thine hand, that thou mayest carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. I mean, just made a crack shot, a random shot, just like goes right between them, right between the horses and gets him. And he said, Carry me, turn your hand. And uh, in verse 34, And the battle increased that day, howbeit the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians, and until even about the time of the sun going down, he died. Turns out Micaiah was right. And really, Jehoshaphat knew that all along. And really, Ahab knew that all along, actually, if he'd been honest about it, didn't he? still happened. It's incredible how prideful we can become, isn't it? Except for Jehoshaphat. You see, there's the silver lining here. Jehoshaphat is ready to die and he cries out, God deliver me. And the Lord helped him, the Bible says, and God moved them to depart from him. God stopped them from killing him. And so this message, when Jehoshaphat returned to his house in peace. Then Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said, Shouldst thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Jehoshaphat, should you help the ungodly and should you love people that hate God? What's the answer? No. My friend, God's enemies are my enemies. Did you hear me? God's enemies are my enemies. You say, Pastor, Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. Yes, I know. God wants the wicked to be saved. But He doesn't want me to be in allegiance with the wicked. Because when I align myself with the wicked, my friend, I have set myself in array against God. God has a very stern message for Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat saw you on the other side. Saw you over on the other side. You ever see somebody's a traitor and they get on the wrong side? supposed to be your friend and yet they side with somebody that's not your friend. Saw you over there. I know what you are. But then God said, but Jehoshaphat, <laughs> there are good things found in thee and that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. Notice, I asked the question earlier, when the Bible says that Jehoshaphat had prepared his heart to seek God, when was that? Well, I think the answer to it is pretty simple. When he started as king, when he began being king in Judah, he prepared his heart to seek God. That was the track record he had. And you know, I think that maybe when he was on the way back to Judah, he prepared his heart to seek God too. I think probably on the way back to Judah, the thought process of Jehoshaphat was something like, how could I have been so stupid? God, I don't know what to say. I don't have an excuse, but I was wrong. God, if you let me live, I'm never going back to Samaria again. I'm never going back to align myself with the wicked again. God, thank you for sparing my life. God, I'm not going to forget who I am and who you are. And I think by the time he got back to Jerusalem, he'd made some resolves. See, from there on, Jehoshaphat had a fantastic track record as king of Judah. 
It's amazing, isn't it? Isn't it? Usually when a guy goes off, he stays off. But not Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was scared to death. <laughs> really. And he cried out to God and God delivered him. And he knew who delivered him. And he served God. And he ended well. And you know something? I don't know about you, but there are some Jehoshaphat moments in most of our lives. No excusing it. You could look at it and you could say, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? What was I thinking? What was I thinking? If God spared you, my friend, you ought to get on the right track and stay there. And take seriously the Word of the Lord. And if you're living and you're breathing, you're different than Ahab was. You're more like Jehoshaphat was. And so God isn't done with you yet. And you can. I want to finish by saying this. When Paul, not Paul, when Solomon wrote the letter to the young men, when he wrote the Proverbs, I'm always amazed by Proverbs. Do you ever think about the irony of Solomon being the wisest man and yet one of the greatest failures ever? Writing to a young man and telling him how not to fail. And most of the things that Solomon tells the young man not to do are things that he's done. And he introduces his letters or his proverbs by saying, A wise man will hear and will increase in learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. And he's contrasting the difference between uh, the simple, the fool, and the wise. The simple person just doesn't, they just blunder into things. A fool uh, goes headlong into things. A scorner, of course, mocks truth. But a wise person hears and increases learning. You don't have to go through a Jehoshaphat failure in order to know where it'll get you. You don't have to be an Ahab and not turn in order to know what the end of Ahab is. I've met so many people in my lifetime that said, Pastor, you know, I know what the truth is and I'm sure I'll probably come around to it, but you know, I just have to learn from my mistakes. That's just the only way I learn. Yeah, I might kill you when you could just learn from the Word of God instead. You young people in this room hear me tonight, you don't have to make the mistakes. You don't have to have the Jehoshaphat stories. Thank God for the mercy that He showed toward Jehoshaphat, but you don't have to have those moments. You can just listen to God, and you can just respond to truth. <clears throat> and God's problem with Jehoshaphat was pretty simple. He aligned himself with God's enemies. People that hated the Lord, Jehoshaphat loved. And you better not do it. Or it'll wreck your life. If you're doing it, you know who you know who and the what and the where and the why and the how, don't you? You actually know. God will just tell you. He'll say, this is what you're doing. Listen, my friend. There's not a good outcome. There's about two. Ahab's or Jehoshaphat's, neither are good. You could just get right with God. You could just confess it, repent, and God will forgive it. And off you go in the right direction. Prepare your heart to serve the Lord. It's a pretty simple message, isn't it? Pretty dramatic story. I'd like to make a play of it sometime. I'd like to have Zedekiah and his horns, and I'd like to really juice it up good. You know? I like to have Micaiah come in and say, don't do it. And, you know, kind of play it down. I, I, liked, I like the, just the whole, it's just a, it's, the drama, but it's great. If you're ever grounded from reading, kids, here you go. But don't miss the lesson. Don't miss the lesson. Don't love people that hate the Lord. Keep your heart perfect before God. Father, I pray that you would help us to learn from this example and I pray that you would help us to see the danger in loving those that hate you and being more concerned about what the wicked think than what you think. But God, at the same time, we've seen this evening as well an example of your mercy. And there may be individuals that say, you know what, I'm kind of, I'm kind of midlife Jehoshaphat right now. Friend, I pray that, God, I just ask you would help 
these individuals to know that right now they could just turn. They don't have to come to a near death or to, to that danger place. But they could just turn to Jesus. We just thank you for what you've taught us this evening. I ask you to help, it to help us to be sober and circumspect about our sin and see the seriousness of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm just really tired tonight, and that's why I preach long. Whenever I'm, I'm tired, I preach long. I woke up on the beach this morning. Didn't know how I got there. What? So, okay, I knew how I got there, but I didn't.